let's begin where we often do, which is by reviewing the structure of the basis of G3, the geometric algebra of R3. At the lowest step of the structure, we have our singular grade zero element in our basis, the singular scalar there. We have three grade one elements, three vectors in our basis, E1, E2, and E3. We have three grade two bivectors, which are formed by taking two of the three vectors at once, E1, E2, E2, E3, and E3, E1. At the highest step of the structure, we have our singular grade three pseudoscalar, which is formed by taking all three vectors at once, E1, E2, E3. This pseudoscalar is often notated, as I will do in this video, by big I. Now, it is this pseudoscalar that I'd like to pay particular attention to in this video, particularly in the way it relates to what's called duality. Let's also remind ourselves of the geometric interpretation of this pseudoscalar E1, E2, E3. Remember, too, that E1, E2, E3, where these products are geometric products, is also equal to E1 wedge, E2 wedge, E3, because all these vectors are mutually orthogonal. E1 wedge, E2, what does that look like? Well, let's say that's E1. Let's suppose that's E2. Now, E1 wedge, E2 is that oriented patch of area, like so. E1 wedge E2. And now that's being wedged with E3. Let's suppose this is E3 over here. So this bivector, this oriented patch of area, is being extended along E3. So it's being extended upward like that. Imagine dragging that patch of area upward like that. And you can see what's formed is a parallelopiped. Hopefully it's clear what's being formed there, that box. Now this E1, E2, E3 is now an oriented volume in G3. It has a signed volume. That's the geometric meaning that we've been giving to E1, E2, E3 and to the pseudoscalars in general. Where the coefficient out front, just taking a, an arbitrary example, let's say 4 times E1, E2, E3, is the amount of volume contained in the box. And this also is a signed volume. That is, you can also have minus 2, E1, E2, E3. This would just indicate a reversed orientation of the volume. Let's also remember an important algebraic feature of the pseudoscalar big I, which is that I will also square to minus 1. Just like many of the other elements in the geometric algebra, this too will square to minus 1. Let's review why that is. I squared is just E1, E2, E3 times E1, E2, E3. That's I squared. Now let me take this E3 and push it over two places to the right. So two swaps, so two minus signs, or no sign change at all, in which, in which case I get E1, E2, and then E1, E2, which is E1, E2 squared. And I have E3, E3, or E3 squared. E1, E2 squared, that scores to minus 1. E3 scores to plus 1. So this is indeed equal to minus 1. So yet another element in the geometric algebra which scores to minus 1. Here's a more interesting algebraic feature of the pseudoscalar big I. Now I claim that big I commutes with everything in this geometric algebra. And we're going to see that first by checking that the pseudoscalar big I commutes with all three of these vectors. That is, I say that E1, for example, times big I is equal to I times E1. And the same for E2 and E3. But let's make sure that this is true. So on the left-hand side, we have E1 times I. This is equal to E1 times E1, E2, E3. Now, what I'm going to do here is take this E1 here and push it two places to the right. Each one of those swaps, because E1, E2, and E3, they all anti-commute, will introduce a minus sign. So even number of pushes or swaps. So no sign change at all, because I have a double negative. What am I left with? I'm left with E1, E2, E3, and then I have that pushed E1 over there. Let me throw some parentheses around that just to emphasize what just happened. 
What is this? E1, E2, E3. That's big I times E1. So indeed, E1 and I will commute. Let's make sure this is true for E2 and I as well. We have E2, E1, E3. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to push this one to the left. So I have minus E1, E2, E2, E3. And then what I'm going to do here is push this over here. So that'll flip the sign again again. So plus E1, E2, E3, E2. Throw some parentheses around there. And I see that this is indeed equal to I times E2. So E2 and I will commute. And let's make sure E3 also commutes. E3 times I. This is E3, E1, E2, E3. And what I'm going to do here is push this one two places to the right. So two sign flips, no sign change at all. We have E1, E2, E3, E3. Again, throw some parentheses there. And that's indeed equal to big I times I3. So what I see here is that given any vector, let me say E sub I, where I could be 1, 2, or 3, times I, that's equal to I times E sub I. So the pseudo-scalar pseudo -scalar commutes with all vectors. And it obviously commutes with scalars. So for example, A times I, where A is a scalar, is equal to I times A. So it commutes with vectors, commutes with scalars. And let's show next that it commutes with the bivectors as well. And that fact that the pseudo-scalar also commutes with the bivectors, that follows upon what we've just shown here, that E sub I, where I could be 1, 2, or 3, times big I is equal to big I times E sub I. For example, if I had E sub I times E sub J, where I is different than J, A is not, I is not equal to J. This could be, for example, E1, E2, or E3, E1, depending on the values of I and J. If I have this, E sub I times E sub J times big I. E sub J times I, these two will commute. So I can rewrite this as E sub I, big I, E sub J. Now this will commute with this because we've just discovered that the pseudo scalar commutes with all vectors. So that's in turn equal to I, big I, times E sub I times E sub J. So we have this equality here. Therefore, the pseudo scalar commutes with everything in the geometric algebra and obviously commutes with other pseudo scalars too because I times I is equal to I times I. So it commutes with everything in the geometric algebra. So that's an important algebraic thing to note because we're going to be employing that quite a bit in this video. Now the multiplication of some elements in the geometric algebra by the pseudoscalar, big I, it's a very simple operation, but it's also a very important operation as we're going to soon see. So what I'm going to do is take the vectors individually. Let's start with E1 and just multiply them by the pseudoscalar just to see what we're getting out of this. So what is E1 times big I? This is E1 times E1, E2, E3, which is equal to E1 squared times E2, E3. E1 squared is 1, so this is equal to E2, E3. That's the first thing I'd like to note. Let me write that off to the side, that E1 times I is equal to E2, E3. So note that I have a vector. Upon being multiplied by the grade 3 pseudoscalar, it gives me something that's grade 2, the bivector E2, E3. Let's also multiply E2 by I. That's going to be E2, E1, E2, E3. Now let me push this one place to the left, so I get minus E2 squared E1, E3 which is equal to minus E1, E3, which is also equal to E3, E1. So again, vector being multiplied by the grade 3 pseudoscalar gives me something that's grade 2, namely E3, E1. Let me write that off to the side just to keep track. So we have E2 times I 
is equal to e3, e1, the y vector. And let's multiply e3 by the pseudoscalar. So it's going to be e3, e1, e2, e3. And what I could do is push this over two places to the left. No sign flip because it's an even number of times. So we get e3 squared times e1, e2, which is just e1, e2, because e3 squares to 1. And once again, a vector being multiplied by the pseudoscalar gives me something that's grade 2, by vector, in this case, e1, e2. Now, what we've just discovered in this set of three equations here is actually very significant geometrically. And to see why it is, so let's actually draw this stuff out. Let's take this first equation, e1 times big I is equal to e2, e3. Let's draw out the relation between e1 and e2, e3. Now, let's suppose this is e1 over here. Let's suppose that's e2, and that is e3. Now, e2, e3, that's a basis by vector. That's going to be this by vector specifically. e2, yg3. e2, yg3 is equal to e2, e3. So this by vector. Notice the relation between this by vector here, with that orientation, and this vector here, e1. Notice that the vector is orthogonal to this oriented patch of area. We have this right angle between the vector e1 and the bivector e2, e3. And notice that if you take your right hand, curl it in the direction indicated like so, curl, your right, curl the fingers of your right hand in this direction, your thumb will point in the direction of e1. So this orthogonal vector is situated using the right hand rule with respect to the oriented patch of area e2, e3. Now we see that the end result of taking e1 times the grade 3 pseudoscalar is to give you a grade 2 element. Notice it's 2 because it's 3 minus 1. Is to give you the grade 2 element such that it's orthogonal to e1, but has the orientation according to the right hand rule. Now let's examine the other two equations too. Let's also consider e2 times big I. We saw above that's equal to e3, e1. Let's also draw that out. Let's draw the by vector e3, e1 first. So that's going to be e3 and e1. Let me draw on the by vector there. And the orientation is going to be this way. Now, if you take the fingers of your right hand, crawl them in that direction, your thumb points in this direction which, lo and behold, is E2 in our scheme. That's orthogonal to that oriented patch of area. So once again, we see that taking E2, multiplying by I, gives you a relation to E3, E1, the oriented patch of area. And let's check the third equation as well. E3 times I, that gives you E1, E2. We throw some parentheses just for emphasis. Let's draw out the by vector e1 yg2. So that's e1, that's e2. With this orientation, again taking the fingers of your right hand, curl them in that direction, your thumb points in this direction, upward like that, which is in our scheme e3. This is orthogonal to the oriented patch of area or orthogonal to the oriented plane, if you prefer to think of it like that. So you see, once again, taking the vector, the grade 1 element, multiplying by the grade 3, gives me a 3 minus 1 graded element, namely e1, e2, the by vector, which is situated to the vector in this orthogonal way, with that orientation according to the right-hand rule. Now, this relation that we've just discovered, especially in the geometric meaning, between the grade 1 vectors and the grade 2 bi vectors, or pseudo vectors, if you prefer. This relation between the two, which is 
mediated in a way by this pseudoscalar, the grade three, the highest graded element, the pseudoscalar. This relation between these two is what I mean by duality. So what I could say is that E2, E3 is dual to E1, or E1 is dual to E2, E3. And the same thing for these duality relations here, and also over here. These particular vectors are dual to the bivectors, and these bivectors are dual to these vectors. And in general, multiplying something by i to get its dual is called a duality transformation. Or when you hear me speak in this video, I might just say that with respect to e2, e3, e1 is dual to that, or it's, it's dual. But this is a very powerful concept, this duality concept, because it allows you to go back and forth between, and g3 allows you to go back and forth between vectors and bivectors, and the other way around, from bivectors over to vectors which is being mediated by a multiplication by the grade three pseudoscalar. And what it allows you to do is, although this isn't as interesting as this one, if you had, let's say some pseudoscalar, let's say a times i, where a is just some scalar, this could be like four times i or minus five times i or whatever. This too, when it's mul being multiplied by i, undergoes a duality transformation. This is gonna, gonna undergo a duality transformation. Uh, we see that this is just equal to a times big I squared. I squares to minus 1, so this is equal to minus a, which is a scalar, a grade 0 element. So we see here that a grade 3 which is, was just mapped through the pseudoscalar to a grade 0. So a grade 3 goes to grade 0. Over here we see that grade 1 goes to grade 2. Grade 2 goes to grade 1 if you multiply by i inverse. We see that what's going on here in general is that if I have something of grade r, when being multiplied by that grade 3 pseudoscalar, that thing of grade r is going to be mapped to something of grade 3 minus r. Now, I add in that qualification that we're working in G3, because if you were working in, say, G4, the pseudoscalar would actually be grade 4. So a vector would actually be mapped to a trivector, something of grade 3. So you get a mapping of the grade 1s to the grade 3s. But notice in general that it's always going to be grade r getting mapped to the dimension of the geometric algebra, if you will. It's 3 in this case because we're working in G3. This would be 4 if we were working in G4. But that minus r, the thing that was just inputted, and going in reverse too. 3 minus r's upon being, upon being multiplied by the pseudoscale, we'll go over to the, to the grade r's. Now just as we can transform the vectors over to the bivectors, the grade 1s over to the grade 2s through the grade 3 pseudoscalar. We can transform this, the grade 2s, back to the grade 1s, very simply. Let's move down here. Let's take note of this first equation. We have E1 times I is equal to E2, E3. Now notice if I multiply both sides on the right by I inverse, which I inverse is just minus I, E1 times I i times i inverse is equal to e2 e3 times i inverse. What we get is e1 is equal to e2 e3 times i inverse. Again, we see that multiplying this by the pseudoscalar, in this case it's just minus i, but it's the same up to a sign, gets me back to a grade 1 element. And we can do very similar things. We can say that e2 is equal to e3 e1 times i inverse. Again, these two are dual. And then we have e3 is equal to e1 e2 times i inverse. So we can see that this set of three equations will also imply this set of three equations, just going back and forth between the vectors and the bivectors. So here are those three equations just written up up here. You can see too that there's a nice relation between the vectors and the indices of the bivector that's dual to it. For example, I have E1 over here. There are only three indices in G3, just one, two, and three. So if you exclude one, the only two indices left are two and three. And you just have to remember the order, whether it's E2, E3, or E3, E2. And we see the same thing is true over here. If you get rid of the two, just have the threes and ones left. Get rid of the three, just have the one and two left. And the order is just determined by the right-hand rule.
Now let's consider not just simple by vectors and their duality relation to a vector in G3, but just a general by vector. Let's say I have some general vector, some general by vector B, which is going to be some scalar A times E1, E2 plus little b times E2, E3 plus C times E3, E1. So some linear combination A, B, and C of the three basis by vectors E1, E2, E2, E3, and E3, E1. Now I've just discovered up here that E1, E2 is equal to E3i, E2, E3 is equal to E1i, that's this one over here, and E3, E1 is equal to E2i. So I can rewrite this very easily as A times E3i plus little b times E1i plus C times E2i. Now let me yank out that i, let me factor out to the right, and let me rewrite the resulting vector over here, the resulting dual vector in the order E1, E2, E3. So this will be b times E1 plus C times E2 plus A E3. That's equal to big B, just a general by vector. And we see a similar sort of thing emerge here. We have a vector here whose coefficients are just B, C, A, which is dual to the by vector B. So let me give this dual vector a name. Let me just call that V. And I can write the following. Some by vector, any general by vector, is equal to some corresponding dual vector, V, times the pseudoscalar I. And I can go back and forth. If I had some general vector, that can be written as dual to the by vector B times I inverse. Now, geometrically, this equation, a general by vector B is equal to some dual vector V times the pseudoscalar I, has a very similar interpretation as the by vectors and their corresponding duals taken individually. Now, in the most abstract sense, if we had some oriented patch of area, let's say it looks like that, just some blob, with this orientation, let's say that's B, and if I had some vector V such that B is equal to V times I, the vector V will look something like this. It would be the vector orthogonal to this oriented patch of area in that direction because of the right-hand rule. Now, let me give you an actual numerical example just to make it absolutely clear what's going on here. Let's consider the bivector, the specific bivector, b is equal to e1, e2 plus e2, e3. This is also going to be easy for me to draw, so that's why I picked that example. But let's notice that e1, e2 through this equation is equal to e3i and e2, e3 by this equation is equal to e1i. Therefore, this is equal to some dual vector times i. The particular dual vector is going to be e1 plus e3. So you can think of this vector as being dual to this by vector. Now let's draw that out. Now, as usual, I'm going to have this direction be the e1 direction, this be the e2 direction, and this one be the e3 direction. Let's draw out this by vector b. I'm going to do a little work over here. e1, e2 plus e2, e3. What I'm going to do is flip the order of those two. This is equal to e1, e2 minus e3, e2. I'm going to factor the e2 out to the right. This is equal to e1 minus e3 times e2. This vector is orthogonal to that. Therefore, this is equal to the wedge product e1 minus e3 wedge e2. So that's going, to that's going to tell me how to draw this out. So I'm going to take the vector e1 minus e3, e1 minus e3, subtract e3. So it's going to be that vector. That vector will be e1 minus e3. That's going to be wedged with e2. So let me wedge those two together. 
drop it parallelogram with the orientation e1 minus e3 wedged over to e2 so it's going to have this orientation now what's the corresponding dual vector that's going to be e1 plus e3 as we've discovered up here let me draw out that vector e1 plus e3 so e1 plus e3 so it's going to be somewhere up there let me draw that in That's E1 plus E3. You can also imagine taking this vector and just sliding it over here to the plane. You can slide vectors around, it doesn't really matter. And you can see, at least graphically, that this vector appears to be orthogonal to the oriented area with the correct orientation too. If you take your fingers of your right hand, curl them in that direction, you do get your thumb pointing in that direction. So we can see that if this were the bivector B, this would be the corresponding V, such that B is equal to V times I. Now here's something pretty cool that we get from duality upon these bivectors. Let's return to that equation that we discovered before, that some bivector B could be written as dual to some vector V, again, being mediated by that pseudoscalar. So b is equal to v times i. Now recall from previous videos that if I take some bivector and square it, what I get is the minus squared magnitude of b, where the magnitude of b is just the amount of area in the parallelogram. Now let's check this out. Let's square both sides. So let's consider b squared b times b. b times b is just vi times vi. Now the i can be shuffled around because it commutes with everything. So this is equal to v squared i squared. i squared to minus 1. So the right hand side is minus b squared. That means that minus b squared is equal to v squared. Now, what's minus b squared? We'll just stick a minus sign on both sides. The left-hand side is equal to the squared magnitude of b. The right-hand side is equal to the squared magnitude of v. Because remember, a vector squared would give me the squared magnitude, squared length of that vector. Which means that the dual vector v has the same magnitude as that bivector b. So the amount of area in the bivector B is equal to the length of the corresponding dual vector. Now let's go back to that pictorial representation. Let's say the bivector was just some blob that looks like this with that orientation. Let's say that's B. Let's suppose a corresponding dual vector such that B is equal to V times I is this. This is orthogonal to the oriented patch of area there. Now, if b is equal to v times i, this b is going to have some amount of area contained in this. Now, v, the length of v, is going to be the same as the amount of area contained in b. The length of the vector is going to be the same as the amount of area contained in b. And the vector is orthogonal to this oriented patch of area using the right-hand rule. So think about those two properties of this vector v when they're related in this way. And what that means is that if you had given me some general B, some bivector B, let's say it looks like this, with, let's say, that orientation this time. Now, if you wanted a vector which is orthogonal to the oriented patch of area using the right-hand rule and had a length equal to the amount of area swept out in B. To obtain that vector V, all I do is take B and multiply by I inverse to get that corresponding V, just using this equation to get to this equation. Suppose I had changed the problem ever so slightly. Suppose that I, I had given you two vectors, let's say A and B. So given two vectors A and B, produce for me a third vector, which is orthogonal to both A and B, 
and has a length equal to the amount of area in the parallelogram determined by A and B. So A and B are going to be sides of this parallelogram here. Give me a third vector, which is going to be of length equal to the amount of area in that parallelogram, and is orthogonal to both A and B, and has the correct orientation given by the right-hand rule. So that vector is going to look something like this. Now, if it's orthogonal to both A and B, it's also going to be orthogonal to, the, to this plane determined by A and B. Let's say it's orthogonal to the plane determined by A wedge B. Now, this specific vector that I've just demanded as a special name, which is the cross product, this would be called A cross B. Those demands are just what it means to take a cross product of two vectors. Now, we already know what this is because we just had that equation, some general bivector b is equal to the dual v times the pseudoscalar i, which is to say v is equal to b times i inverse. So this specific vector being produced is just going to be this bivector, big B, which is just really a wedge b times i inverse, which just to remind you, i inverse is equal to minus i. It's nothing foreign. So what this means is that we can say what the cross product is in terms of the wedge product and the pseudoscalar. This cross product between two vectors, a cross b, is equal to a wedge b times i inverse. So we see that the cross product and the wedge product in G3 are dual to one another. So these two are in this duality relation in G3. Now I emphasize in G3 specifically because it only makes sense to talk about such a unique vector, which is both orthogonal to two other given vectors and has a length equal to the area swept out by A wedge B with the correct orientation. It only makes sense to talk about a unique vector in three dimensions. And you can see why that is, because this is of grade two. This is demanded to be of grade one, so that means the pseudoscalar of this geometric algebra would have to be of grade three if you're demanding such a unique thing. So you can see why it only makes sense to talk about a cross product, a unique cross product vector in G3. It means in any other space it really makes no sense to talk about such a unique vector. But this equation here, that a cross b is equal to a wedge b times i inverse, means that we don't really have to learn too much more about something called a cross product because it's already contained in ideas that we already know about. We already know how to work with a wedge product. We already know how to work with the pseudoscalar. So, so there's really no extra need to talk about things like cross products, even if you're working in G3. It's already given by this stuff on the right-hand side. So the cross product here is being defined in terms of the wedge product and the pseudoscalar. It's being defined as dual to the wedge product. So there's really no need, again, to talk about something extra called the cross product. Now, just for interest, let's actually go through this equation just to make sure that the right-hand side, what we're writing down here on the right-hand side, really is the cross product. So let's compute this. So let's consider a wedge b times i inverse. So let me write a like this, a1 e1 plus a2 e2 plus a3 e3. We're going to wedge that with the vector b. Let me write it like this. b1 e1 plus b2 e2 plus b3 e3. And that's being multiplied by i inverse. So let's wedge these two vectors together. So this is going to be multiplied by i inverse. Now this is going to have a e1, e2 term. So let's consider that first. That's going to be obtained by wedging this one with this one. So the coefficient up front is going to be a1, b2. So a1, b2. We're also going to have a contribution from the wedging of this one with this one. But we're going to have a sign flip because it's e2, e1. So we need to flip that around. So it's actually going to be minus a2, b1. So that right there is a coefficient in front of e1, wedge e2, or e1, e2. Let's consider the e2, 
E3 term next, so it's going to be A2, B3. A2, B3. Then we have this wedged with this one. It's going to have a minus sign, so it's going to be minus A3, B2. That's equal to but that's the coefficient sitting out front of e to e3. And the last one is going to be e3, e1. That'll come from this being wedged with this. So we have a3, b1. And then we have minus this being wedged with this. So minus a1, b3. And then we're going to distribute this i inverse to each one of these three terms. So we're going to have this coefficient times e1, e2 times i inverse. But e1, e2 times i inverse was just e3. So this is actually going to be the e3 part over here. So this is equal to, because it's e3, I'm going to write it over here. So something times e3 is going to be a1, b2 minus a2, b1. Let's consider this term next. e2, e3 times i inverse is equal to e1. So I'm going to write that over here. That's the e1 part. And the coefficient is just this over here. a2, b3 minus a3, b2. And the only thing left is the e2, which is going to be obtained from e3, e1 times i inverse. And the corresponding coefficient is going to be a3, b1, minus a1, b3. So that's equal to a wedge b times i inverse. Now, let's compute the cross product in that normal way that you would compute the cross product, which is to take your vectors and set them up in a 3 by 3 matrix and take the determinant. So the 3 by 3 matrix would be be formulated like this, e1, e2, e3 in the top row. Then we have the, in the second row, the a vector. And in the third row, we have the b vector, b1, b2, b3. And if you take a look here, what's the e1 coefficient going to be? Well, you imagine crossing out that first row, cross out the first column, take the determinant, of this 2 by 2 matrix over here. The determinant would be a2, b3, minus a3, b2, which is precisely this coefficient out here. So that one works. What's next for the e2 coefficient? Well, you imagine crossing out the first row, the second column. But here you've got, because if this is the way the determinant works, you've got to add in a minus sign. So it's actually going to be minus a1 times b3 plus a3 b1, that's the correct coefficient right there. And the last coefficient is going to be the e3. That's going to be crossing out the first row, the third column. Then we take the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix here, which is going to be a1, b2 minus a2, b1, which is indeed the third coefficient over here. So we see that this right-hand side is indeed a cross b. Now, there are a few other things we could note about the cross product just by working with this equation a little bit, which I've just changed to u's and v's instead of a's and v's because we're usually using u's and v's. u cross v is equal to u wedge v times i inverse. Or if you want to, you can also write this as u wedge v is equal to u cross v times i, just multiplying both sides by i. But this equation is a little bit better, even though these two are equivalent, because the wedge product is completely general. The cross product is something specific to G3. It only, only makes sense in three dimensions, whereas the wedge product is totally general. So it's, think, it's better to think of the cross product in terms of the wedge product and the pseudoscalar, not as the wedge product being defined in terms of the cross product. So this, this equation is a little bit better. But like I said, there are a few properties of the cross product we can note immediately just by looking at this equation, which is that if I take a vector and cross it with itself, let's say u cross u. This equation says that this is the same thing as u wedge u times i inverse. 
what's a vector wedge with itself that's equal to zero? Which is something you probably know about the cross product too, is that a vector crossed with itself is equal to zero. More generally, if you take a vector, u, and you cross it with a vector in the same direction as u, that is to say some scalar multiple, let's say lambda times u, you also get zero. The reason being that this is the same thing as u wedge lambda u. This lambda can be yanked out, in which case you just get lambda times u wedge u times i inverse, which is again equal to zero. It's also obvious that the cross product is anti-commutative. That is, if I take uh, u cross v, that's again equal to u wedge v times i inverse. Now, u wedge v is equal to minus v wedge u times i inverse. Applying this equation one more time to this right here tells me that this is equal to minus v cross u. So u cross v is equal to minus v cross u. So all these properties of the cross product are just obvious when looking at this equation here. And you can see that it inherits many of the features of the wedge product because it's dual to the wedge product. At this point, I'd like to do a sort of hit parade of applications of duality in G3. Now, the first application I'd like to talk a bit about is the adding of bivectors in G3. Now, in G3, as we saw before, some general bivector is going to be associated with dual vector, let's say v times i. Now, suppose I wanted to add two bivectors, let's say b1 and b2. So b1 can be written as v1 times i, and b2 can be thought of as dual to some vector, let's say v2 times i, which means if I wanted to just compute b1 plus b2, just add two bivectors. Remember in that video, it was actually very difficult to draw all this stuff out. Whereas the addition of vectors is something rather easy to, uh, to visualize. So if you wanted to add these two bivectors, so let's say b1 plus b2, this equation says that b1 is equal to v1i plus v2i. Just factor, those, factor that i out to the right. And we see that the resultant sum bivector is going to be dual to some vector, namely the sum of the two dual vectors. So this is pretty neat. So you can think of the bivector sum as being dual to a specific vector as well, namely the vector obtained by summing the respective dual vectors of b1 and b2 individually. Here's another application of duality to rotations in G3, because we've talked a lot about rotations in three dimensions. So let's apply this to rotations as well. So let's say you had some rotation in mind, which we normally think of as occurring in a particular plane. Let's say you have this blob of area with this orientation. So you want the rotation to occur in this blob of area. Let's call that B hat. It's got to be of unit blob area with that orientation. And you want the rotation to be through some angle theta. Well, if you want to rotate vectors in that way, the formula to do such a thing is the following. Take the vector v, operate on the right by e to the theta over 2 times b hat, and operate on the left by its conjugate, which is minus theta over 2, e to the minus theta over 2 times b hat. And that's your resultant vector. Now, because we can think of bivectors as being dual to a vector, we could say that b hat is equal to some corresponding dual vector. So let me use n to symbolize that vector, specifically n hat, because n is also going to be of unit length, because it's, this bivector is assumed to be of unit magnitude. So we can think of this b hat as being equal to n hat times i. So just substitute that right into the equation. So the resultant vector v prime is going to be equal to e to the minus theta over 2 times n hat i times v times e to the theta over 2 n hat times i. So what does this mean? In three dimensions, when you're doing a rotation, it's equivalent to think of the rotation as occurring in a plane and also about an axis. 
So you can also think of it, if you prefer, this rotation as occurring about this axis given by the unit vector n hat, which is orthogonal to the plane in which the rotation is occurring. Now, this is something specific, again, to three dimensions. This is because the wedge product and bi vectors are much more general. The fact that something dual to something of grade 2 is something of grade 1 only occurs in, in G3, in three dimensions specifically. So this is something that's kind of specific to three-dimensional rotations working in three dimensions. And so it's really the only space in which it's appropriate or equivalent to think of a rotation as occurring around an axis, whereas it's totally general to think of rotations as occurring in a plane given by some bivector. So this is more general, and this form is actually more general. This is something kind of specific to three dimensions. But if you need to think of it like this, you can. And that's because of duality. Another neat little thing is if we go all the way back to the geometric product between two vectors, let's say uv, we know that this is equal to u dot v plus u wedge v. But now we know that the wedge product and the cross product are dual in G3. So we could rewrite this geometric product actually in the following way. uv is equal to u dot v plus u cross v times i. So you can see here that the geometric product is being expressed in, two, in terms of the two major vector operations in G3. So that's something kind of neat to uh, point out. Another interesting thing we can do because of this rewriting of the geometric product is something that ties into what we we're covering in the last video, which is the connection between elements of the even subalgebra of G3 and the quaternions. And what we can do is we can use the duality between wedge product and cross product in G3 to derive the quaternionic product. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say I had two elements of the even subalgebra, which we found to be isomorphic to the quaternions. Let's say Q1, which is going to be equal to something that looks like this, some scalar a1 plus a bivector b1. And suppose I had another one, another element of the even subalgebra, or another quaternion, which is equal to another scalar a2 plus another bivector b2. Now we can use duality upon b1 and b2. We can rewrite these like this. We can rewrite b1 as being dual to some vector, let's say v1 times i. And we can do the same for b2. Rewrite that as being dual to some vector, say v2, times i. Now, what is the product between q1 and q2? Now, this is actually the geometric product here, not yet the quaternionic product, but we're going to see how we get the formula for the quaternionic product. Now, q1 times q2, this is going to be a1 plus v1i times a2 plus v2i. And I'll distribute this. First, I'll have a1 times a2, a1, a2. Next, I'm going to write a1 v2i plus a2 v1i. I'm just going to yank out the vi. I'm going to factor that out. So I have a1 v2 plus a2 v1, that's times i. Then the final thing that's left is, I'm actually going to write this up here because I want to do a little simplifying. It's going to be v1i, v2i. Remember the i commutes with everything, so this is really v1, v2, i squared, which is equal to minus v1, v2. So the minus geometric product between those two dual vectors, v1, v2. So this is actually going to be minus v1, v2. Now, a geometric product between two vectors, v1, v2, I can use this writing of the geometric product here, using the dot product and the cross product between the two vectors. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to note that this is going to have a scalar part, which is going to be minus v1 dot v2. I'm going to write that over here with the scalars, with this scalar over here, a1, a2, minus v1 
dot v2, the dot product between those two dual vectors. Then this is going to have a grade two part, which is being expressed as dual to the cross product, which is going to be minus v1 cross v2 times i. That has a factor in common with this one, so I'm just going to add that in right there into this vector part. It's going to be plus. This is all going to be times i. I'm just going to carry these through. a1 v2 plus a2 v1. Then this is going to be minus v1 cross v2. So this is the product q1, q2. Notice that this from here to here is a scalar, grade zero. This from here to here is the new dual vector. And this from here to here is the new grade two part. But also notice if you've studied quaternions at all, this is the quaternionic product when you write a quaternion in terms of scalar vector part. This from here to here, this would be the new scalar part, a1, a2, minus the dot product between the vector parts. And this would be the new so-called vector part of the quaternion, which here it's being expressed as the new dual vector when these two are being multiplied, a1, v2, plus a2, v1, minus the cross product. Now, there's a sign flip because there's a little bit of a handedness difference between the quaternions and uh, geometric algebra. But the formula, other than that, is the same. So this is actually where the quaternionic product comes from. Now, another thing that duality can shed some light upon is the geometric product between vector and a bivector. Now, to see that, consider the following example. Let's say we had some bivector b right here, which is oriented in the following way. And consider some vector u, which is not necessarily on the plane. In this picture, it's going to be off the plane. Now consider the geometric product between u and b. Now you'll notice in previous videos, we were also able to express this also as a dot product between a vector and bivector. A little bit different between the dot product between vector and vector, but dot product between vector and bivector. Also a wedge product between vector and bivector. Now, the way in which duality can shed some light upon this is that this bivector v, b, can be expressed as dual to a vector. Again, using that formula, b is equal to v times i. Now, if b is given in this orientation, then the corresponding dual vector is going to look something like this. It's going to be orthogonal to b in that orientation using the right-hand rule. It's going to be orthogonal to the plane. And what we can do is substitute b equals v times i right into this. So we can say, instead of u times b, we can say u v i. And we just use the associative rule to multiply these two vectors together using the geometric product between two vectors, which is just the dot product between those vectors, u dot v multiply by the pseudoscalar i plus u wedge v times the pseudoscalar i. Now we can see immediately we have a scalar here, u dot v, now being multiplied by the pseudoscalar. So this is actually the grade 3 part of the geometric product between vector and bivector. Remember, we have a tri-vector part. We also have a vector part, and that's this stuff over here. From here to here is the grade one part, the vector part. And we see that immediately because this right here is grade two. It's some wedge product between u and v. It's the wedge product, but then multiplied by the pseudoscalar. So we have the duality coming in. And that maps it to something of grade one, a vector. So this right here is the vector part of the product between vector and bivector. And right here is the tri vector part. Now, this part over here was actually what we were calling u dot b. This is the grade one part. And then this part over here was the tri-vector part. So this right here is actually this, and this is actually this. 
So let's actually take a look at that vector part, which would be u dot b. So as we noted, this is the same as u wedge v times i. But this almost looks like a cross product, according to the formulas we had before. Except the cross product is actually equal to a wedge product times i inverse. But that's easy to remedy. What we can do is the following. Just switch the order of these two. That introduces a minus sign. So we have minus v wedge u times i. But minus i is equal to i inverse. So this is actually equal to v wedge u times i inverse. And that is equal to v cross u. So we found that u dot b is equal to v cross u, where b is related to v according, in, in the following way. So looking at the diagram, remember we were saying before what the dot product between vector and bivector means is that you take the vector u, project it onto the plane. Let's suppose its projection looks something like this. This is the part on the plane. This is the part off the plane. Project it onto the plane. Rotate it in the plane 90 degrees according to the orientation. So this way, so this projected part is going to get rotated 90 degrees. So it's going to be in that direction. And it's also going to be scaled up or down depending upon the amount of area contained in B. If B were of unit length, it would be preserved. But it's going to be scaled by some amount. So this would be in the general direction of u dot b. It looks something like that. But take a look at this formula and take a look at the diagram. So we say that u dot b is equal to v cross u. So consider the cross product between v and u. Remember, u is being broken up into a part orthogonal to v and also a part parallel to v. Remember, the cross products, you only consider the perpendicular part. So the cross product between v and u, if you take your right hand, start a v, cross over to this, your thumb indeed points in that direction. So this makes this formula makes total sense. So this is actually one way to think of the dot product between vector and bivector. What's also neat about thinking of this in terms of duality is that the duality reveals a duality in the operations of this dot product with the wedge product over here. So I'm going to take this equality over here, slightly rewrite it. On the left hand side, I'm going to say this. U wedged with some vector v. Consider the dual that is multiplied by i. That's the same as u dotted with the dual of v. So we see here that the dual is operating upon the wedge product, but that can be converted to u being dotted with the dual of v. So we see a nice duality between the outer product and an inner product. And yet another interesting duality between inner and outer product is revealed by this being the same as this. So let me write that down here. So we see that u dot v, just a dot product, a plain old dot product between two vectors. Consider the dual of that, which would be something of grade 3 now. This is the same as u wedged with b, where b is related to v in that, in that way over there, which is the same as u wedged with the dual of v. So we see that Again, we have this duality between the inner product and an outer product. So if you take the dot product, two vectors, consider the dual. That's the same as taking u and wedging it with the dual of that second vector v. Here's another interesting application of duality. Now, suppose I had some vector u, another vector v, and I had a third vector w. Now suppose I take u and then wedge it with v, generating that parallelogram there with that orientation because it's u wedge v. And suppose I take this by a vector and wedge that with w. That is, I extend it along the vector w. 
And what that'll generate is a parallel pipette that'll look something like this once that gets extended. So let me write out what I've just done. So I take U, wedge with V, and then that gets wedged with W. So what we know from our experience is that this is going to generate some grade three object, which is going to be some scalar multiple, let me say lambda, of big I. Where lambda here is going to be the amount of assigned volume in this parallelopiped. Now here's what I can do. Suppose I were just interested in that scalar on its own. Now what I could do is multiply both sides by I inverse. So multiply both left and right by I inverse. So what that means is that the amount of directed volume is going to be u wedge v wedge w times i inverse. Now let's expand this out a little bit. Notice that I can use the associative rule with these wedge products. And what I have here is a wedging between vector and bivector. So a wedge product between vector and bivector is can be written out in the following way, if you recall from previous videos. U times V wedge W plus V wedge W times U. And this is going to be all times I inverse. Remember, in the wedge product between vector and by vector, this is actually a plus sign, not a minus sign, as it is between vector and vector. Now here's something I could do. I could just distribute this I inverse to this factor specifically, V wedge W. And I can rewrite it like this. One half U V wedge W times I inverse. Let me throw a set of parentheses just for emphasis. Plus V wedge W times I inverse times U. Now, what is V wedge W I inverse? That's just the cross product between V and W. Let me write that. One half U times V cross W plus V cross W times U. Now look at what I have here. I have a vector times another vector plus this vector times another vector in reversed order. Now that's just a dot product between two vectors. This is going to be a specific dot product, namely u dotted with v cross w, which generates the scalar lambda, the amount of directed volume in this box. Now, this specific product of three vectors is called the scalar triple product. And the name tells you what you need to know. It's a scalar, and it's a triple product because it's a product of sorts, a mixed product between dot and cross products between three vectors. And the geometric interpretation is obvious from this, the way we set the whole thing up. This is the amount of directed volume contained in this parallel pipette. Let me show you yet another application of duality, this time involving the cross product of three vectors. So let's say we had some vector u, another vector v, and we consider first the cross product u cross v. Let me draw in the parallelogram defined by u and v, so u wedge v, that orientation. Now the cross product vector u cross v is going to look something like this. There's u cross v, orthogonal to the plane with the correct orientation. Now, what I'd like to do next is cross this with a third vector. Let's call this w. Let's suppose w looks like this. Now, this is going to be above the plane, so let me try to draw this in, project it onto the plane. Suppose it looks like that. There's the part on the plane of u wedge v, and here's the part off the plane. Now we see 
just geometrically, that when we take W and now cross it with this cross product vector, considering only the part of W which is perpendicular to U cross V, that's going to be this vector right here, the part which is orthogonal to U cross V, crossed with this vector. Now, if you use the right hand rule, start here, curl your fingers up to here, your thumb points that way. So the resultant vector of this triple product is going to be on the plane of u wedge v, because it's going to, be, it's going to have to be orthogonal to this cross product vector, and it's going to be orthogonal to that vector. So it's going to be 90, 90 degrees that way, but on the plane, and scaled by some amount. So this is the triple product that I'm interested in, w cross u cross v. Right, the cross product is not associative, so you've got to keep those parentheses in there. This is 90 degrees. And again, this is on the plane of U wedge V. Now, what I'm interested in is coming up with a more convenient formula for this vector triple product. And this is what's called the vector triple product. Again, it's a triple product because it involves three vectors. The vector because what comes out is a vector. This is a vector, and then vector cross with the vector gives you another vector. So this looks like it's going to be a mess, but it actually won't be once we use the dual relations accurately. Now, what I'm going to do is take note that I have a vector crossed with yet another vector. Or the cross product is in that dual relation with the wedge product. So I'm going to rewrite this in the following way. W wedged with that second vector, U cross V. So W wedge, U cross V. And if you go back to the formulas, this is actually going to be times i inverse. This whole thing times i inverse. Now, what I have here, just focusing on here to here, the stuff inside the parentheses, I have a vector wedged with another vector. So what I'm going to do is use a very old formula for the wedge product between two vectors, which is going to be 1 half w times u cross v minus u cross v times w still times i inverse and the next thing i'm going to do is distribute this i inverse to both terms but i'm going to write it in a very specific way w times u cross v times i inverse i'm going to throw a set of parentheses around there just for emphasis minus u cross v times i inverse times w and that's it and notice what do i have here and here i have a cross product times i inverse that's going to be a wedge product so what that's going to be is going to be w times now we're gonna have to look carefully here this is going to be actually the minus of this because the cross product times i is actually what gets you to the wedge product so this is actually going to be minus u wedge v which is the same thing as v wedge u so make sure you understand that step right there this is going to be v wedge u times w and finally what do i have here I have one half a vector times by vector minus that very same by vector times a vector. Now that minus sign there, when we have vector by vector by vector vector, is actually the dot product between vector and by vector. So this is actually the dot product between w and the by vector v wedge u. So so far I have that this is equal to this. So I've erased some stuff here, but if you take a look at this formula already, using what you know about the dot product between vector and bivector, you should see that this formula already makes sense, that it should be equal to the same thing if we've drawn all of, all of our pictures accurately. I think we have. But what I'd like to do is take a little detour and look at something of the form where we have three vectors, where we have one vector dotted with the wedge product of two other vectors. That is to say, something of the form a dotted with 
B wedge C, where A, B, and C are vectors, because this is something that's going to pop up over and over again. And it's a useful identity for this. Now, what I'm going to do is derive an equivalent expression for this. Now, I claim that what results from this, we know it's going to be some vector, but I claim it's going to be some linear combination of B and C. Therefore, it's going to be in the plane of B and B wedge C. Now, what I'm going to do is just use some expansions I'm already familiar with. First, I have vector dotted with by vector. That's equal to one half A times B wedge C minus B wedge C, or the minus sign for the dot product between vector by vector times A. Then I'm going to expand these two wedge products here. These are just wedge products between two vectors. So what I'm going to get is one half a times one half bc minus cb minus one half bc minus cb times a. I'm going to yank out the one halves out front. So what I get is one fourth. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, distributing here. So I have abc minus acb. Then over here I have minus BCA plus CBA. So what we're going to do next is use an identity involving the dot product to switch the order of A and B over here, and also A and C over here. What I'm going to do is recall that the dot product A dot B is equal to one half AB plus BA. That implies that twice the dot product is equal to AB plus BA. Solving for AB, what I see is that this is equal to 2 A dot B minus BA. So you see I can make this substitution here. AB being equal to twice the dot product between them minus the 2 in the reversed order. I'm going to use that between the A and B over here. So I'm going to rewrite this as 1 fourth twice the dot product between them A dot B minus BA times C. And I'm going to do a similar trick with the A and C over here. So this is going to be twice the dot product between the two, A dot C minus C A, the reversed order. That's still times B. And let me carry out over these two terms over here, minus B C A plus C B A. Let me distribute that over there. So I have 2 a dot b times c minus b a c minus 2 a dot c times b plus c a b minus b c a plus c b a. Now I'd like to introduce a little notational convention here. When I drop the parentheses like that, what we're going to do is consider the dot product and the wedge product to have priority over the geometric product. So when you read this, read it as doing this dot product between A and B first, then multiplying the scalar result by C. Same thing over here. And what I'm going to do here is write this in a slightly different order. I'm going to write this term and this term first. So I have twice a dot b times c minus 2 a dot c times b. What I'm going to do is note that this term and this term have a common factor of minus b to the left. So I'm going to yank out the minus b. And what I get is ac plus ca. And I notice between this term and this term, they have a common factor of plus c to the left. So I'm going to yank that out. I get ab plus ba. And that's it. Let me carry over those first two terms. Twice a dot b times c minus 2 a dot c times b. Now, what is this thing right here? a c plus c a. Well, that's two times the dot product between a and c. So here I have twice the dot product between a and c times b plus. Same thing over here. a b plus b a is twice the dot product between a and b. 
plus twice a dot b times c. What do I have? I can combine this term now, two times that stuff, plus two times that stuff. So what I have is one fourth, four a dot b times c. Then I have minus four, combine these two terms, a dot c times b. And what I have is that this is equal to a dot b times c minus a dot c times b. And that's equal to what's up here. Let me just write that down here. a dot b wedge c. So that's an important identity there for a vector being dotted with a wedging of two other vectors. You can see that's a linear combination, as we were saying before, of the two vectors b and c. The right linear combination to use is to have the coefficient in front of b be minus a dot c, and the coefficient in front of c be a dot b. And the last step is to apply this identity to what we've got up here. So w dotted with v wedge u, just applying this formula, is going to be w dotted with v times u minus w dotted with u times v. And that's equal to the vector triple product, which is w crossed with, in parentheses, u cross v. So there you go. There it's, that's the vector triple product written in terms of a linear combination of u and v. So here's the identity involving the vector triple product that we've just derived up here. As an exercise, what I'd like you to do is verify the so-called Jacobi identity. Let me tell you what that is. What I'd like you to verify is, if a, b, and c are vectors, the following is true. a crossed with b cross c plus b crossed with c cross a plus c crossed with a cross b is equal to zero. And notice what's going on here in terms of the simple shuffling here. If I start with this one, I have an a, b, and a c. If you consider these as just three slots and the cross product operation being preserved, just three slots. And what you're doing here is you're cycling the letters through. You're cycling A over to B, B over to C, and C over to A. So you have A, B, C, and then B, C, A, then C, A, B. You're just shuffling the letters around. Now, verify that this sum here is indeed equal to zero, and that's just an application of this identity using involving the vector triple product. And that'll do it for this video. Thanks for watching.